want you to grab your Bibles and I want you to turn to the back of your Bible to the book of Revelation and then just right in front of it there's one little book called Jude. If you didn't bring your Bible it's page 188 in the Bible in the rack there. Page 188 in the New Testament section. Today is our fifth in our series of six messages on Jude. We're going to wrap it up next Sunday and then move into Easter. And before I preach this morning, I just want to share with you that uh, uh, I'm sure you know we have a service here at 1030 Tuesday for Pastor Brooks. He has gone home to heaven. And we will celebrate his life here Tuesday and celebrate all that God did in his life and through him. Great man. I had the joy of knowing Pastor Brooks for 25 years. And we worked side by side. And an uh, incredible man. And uh, uh, if you can come Tuesday, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> and... Uh, we will miss him greatly, but uh, he's in glory, and uh, we are thankful. We are thankful for that. You know, I got the call Thursday that he had gone home, and I sat down with my Bible, and I was reading not only my Proverbs, but I was reading through my Bible this year, and I was reading back in Second Samuel. And uh, Abner had just been killed, and Joab, or, uh, yeah, Joab killed him, and uh, David mourned for him. And listen to what David said about Abner. The king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I read that that morning after Brother John had just gone home. A prince and a great man has fallen. And um, we had the privilege of walking with a great man. And we are thankful for that. Um, well, let's get back to Jude. <clears throat> we are in Jude. And uh, beginning today in uh, the 17th verse is where we're at. Um, Jude is about defending the faith. Jude is about apostasy. If you didn't get the outline, hold up your hand. The ushers will hand you one. Uh, Jude is about apostasy. We've been learning about this thing called apostasy. And it is people who, uh, who profess but don't really possess. People who mentally believe the faith but not in their heart. And they turn from the faith and they begin to teach that which is not the faith. And they, we see in verse 4, they creep in. And uh, the greatest assault on the church is not outside per persecution. The greatest assault on the church is those who would come in and destroy it from the inside. And we see this in nations. Rome really fell from the inside. And uh, I, I fear more for our America not from an outside attack, but from what we see happening on the inside. And so, uh, so in our churches, uh, the greatest assault is an inside job. And this little letter was strategically placed before the book of Revelation because a great apostasy will take place before uh, the tribulation, the Antichrist can come and, and our Lord can return. And so we see it's... Uh, its uh, placing is very significant. And, and uh, we have seen that Jude has been uh, talking to us about these apostates. And uh, uh, he uh, assures us of their judgment. And uh, Israel was judged when they disobeyed God. Uh, the fallen angels judged cast out of heaven, Sodom and Gomorrah judged, um, these people go in the way of Cain, 
faith that is not uh, God's way, it is without the blood, atonement without the blood, salvation by works, um, the heir of Balaam living for this world for personal gain, and uh, the rebellion of Korah uh, defying authorities. Uh, he's reminded us of Old Testament scriptures dealing with apostasy, and he says God will come back and uh, he will deal with these people for whom the blackness of darkness has been reserved forever. We saw that little phrase last Sunday. And he will come back, and we see verse 15, to execute judgment upon all, and they will face the justice of God. God is not only a God of love, but he's a God of justice. And uh, these people will face that justice of God. They will be judged and he will execute judgment. And we see, we see all that. Now in verse 17. Are you open with me? Verse 17. Look at the first three words. But you, beloved. Now look at verse 20. But you, beloved. Now who is he talking to now? Is, is he talking to the apostates? Uh, no, no. He is talking now to the believers. He is talking now to those who know Jesus Christ. I've been looking forward to get to this, this part of the book. Uh, excited about it. But you beloved. He calls them beloved. We saw earlier some Sundays ago that God has a special love for those who have put their faith in His Son and spiritually been born into the family God has a special love for his children. Oh, wait a minute. Doesn't God love everybody? Oh, yes, he loves everybody. He loves the whole world. But he has a special, just like you do. You know, you love all children, but you have a special love for your kids. God has a special love. But you beloved, but you beloved, he says, 17 and 20. And he tells us three things to help us to know how we should survive this apostasy. How should we handle this? How should we respond to all this that we've been looking at in the book of Jude and going through this era in the latter days of apostasy? How should we respond? God gives us three things, and I want you to see them. He says, first of all, in verse 17, but you, beloved, ought to remember. That's the first one. Remember. You, beloved, remember the words which were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember these words that were spoken by the apostles. In contrast to the words of the apostates, verse 16, these are grumblers, finding fault, following after their lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining, for sake of gain or advantage. Uh, in contrast to listening to that, Remember the words of the apostles. Remember the words. Now he speaks of New Testament truth. And the warnings that we have received in 1 Timothy 4, as Paul wrote to Timothy, the Spirit says, in the last times many will fall away from the faith and warned us. He pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, reminding them of these things. You see, forgetfulness of great truths is one of our problems. We tend to forget. That's why, that's why the Lord gave us reminders. That's why we come to church, to be reminded. He gave uh, his people in the Old Testament a reminder. Remember, they came out of Egypt by the Passover, and then he gave them uh, the annual Passover feast where they would remember and he said this is a night much to be remembered and next Sunday we will take communion and he said do this in remembrance of me why because he knows my tendency your tendency to forget to forget and so uh, Peter reminds us in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust. Remember, it is in the imperative. 
It is a command. And Jude said in verse 5 of Jude, I desire to remind you, though you know all these things, I'm reminding you of things you already know. Don't be deceived. First of all, remember. Number two, the second thing he said to do is in uh, 20 and 21. Look at these verses. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. It's in verse 21 there. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Not only remember, but remain. Remain in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You mean, Pastor Carl, I got to work for God's love? I got to make God love me? I got to earn? No, no. That's not what he's saying at all. Not at all. Here's what he's saying. He's saying remain in the sphere of God's love. There's two places you can be. You can be in the place of blessing and be blessed and have God's love poured out on you in a special way and allow him to to love you and to pour out his love on you. Or you can be in the place of discipline. Discipline. You remember the story about the prodigal son? Do you know, even when he was in the pig pen, his father loved him. (laughs) But he couldn't pour out his love on him. Because he wasn't in the place. He wasn't in the sphere of God's love. God loved him the same when he was in the pig pen. Um, But he couldn't pour out his love on him. And so what is he saying when he says remain in God's love? He's really saying stay in God's will. Stay in the place of blessing. This morning I uh, was leaving to come to church. And uh, I made, I poured a little coffee in my cup and had a cap on it. And I went out to get in the car. And sure enough, it never fails. You know, last night before I uh, went to bed, I picked out what I was going to wear today. So Gail always irons my shirt for me. And so I like to give her some input. And so I picked out two, chir- two shirts and one pair of pants. And, uh, and so, you know, she could decide which shirt I should wear. And so this morning when she came down, I said, so which shirt did you iron for me? She said, well, the orange one had a spot on top of the pocket that I got to get off, and so I ironed the green one for you. You're not wearing that thing with a spot on it. Okay, dear. So I put the green one on, and uh, I got into the car with my cup of coffee, and I looked down. Oh, my lands, coffee. (laughs) On my green shirt, I spilled it getting in the car. I said, if my wife sees this, I am dead meat. You know, I'm, I'm in a world of hurt. I have to sneak back in the house and get this coffee off my shirt so she doesn't see me or she'll make me change my shirt again. (laughs) Put on a different. So I went back in and I, she wasn't in the kitchen. And so I took a cloth and got it good and wet and I got my shirt all wet, you know, got the coffee off, I think. And and, uh, you can't see it, can you? (laughs) Tell me you can't. And... uh, So then I came to my office and met with my prayer partners, and Nate said, you got a spot on your shirt. (laughs) Because it was all wet, and it hadn't dried yet. And I told him my story, that's that's supposed to dry before church. He said, and Nate was sitting right where the sun was coming through the glass, through the window, and I mean, I said, you need some shades, man, you can't even look. And uh, he said, why don't you sit here in the sun, and that'll help that dry. So we traded places, and I sat in the sun. And I felt the warmth of that sun. And the rest of those poor, miserable guys, they sat in the shade. They didn't get the warmth of that morning east sun coming in. And it was beautiful. And you know what? I think that's exactly what God is saying here. Keep yourself in the warmth of God's love. Be in the... You can stay out in the shade and the cold if you want to, or you can move in and receive. That's what he's saying here. Keep yourself in the love of God. 
when you spill coffee on your shirt. I, I, that's in the Hebrew. <laughs> you see, a disobedient child has put himself in the place where he cannot enjoy his father's love, right? Now, does his father love him? Oh, yeah. But he can't enjoy his father's love. Uh, what do you do when your child disobeys you? Well, you pack their suitcase and you set them down on the couch and you set that suitcase by them and say, there's your stuff in that suitcase. You ever disobey us again? You're taking that suitcase and you're going down the road. We're disowning you. That's not how you, disobey, uh, how you discipline your disobedient child, is it? You do not disown your children. You discipline them. You discipline them. And that's exactly what God does. Did you know that? I don't have time to read it all to you, but Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11, talks about the discipline of God. Every son whom he receives, he disciplines. You know? Been there, done that, right? You know, I've had the discipline of God, and it's not fun. And uh, he says, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. And uh, he, he disciplines us. Remain. Well, you say, well, how do I remain in the love of God? Let me give you three things. And they're right here for us in these verses. Look at verse uh, uh, 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith. There's verb, building. That's the first verb, building up. How do you remain in the will of God, remain in the place of blessing? You need to build yourself up on the faith. Build yourself on the faith, the holy faith. The faith is the foundation on which you build. We saw this, verse 3, contend for the faith, which was once and for all delivered uh, to our forefathers. This same faith, you need to build yourself on it. Build yourself up, he says. Do you see that little phrase? Building yourself up. This is like spiritually working out. Pastor Steve took uh, half a dozen of our kids to a, to a powerlifting meet yesterday. And they competed. I haven't heard how they did. Did good. Got a medal. Oh my. All of them medaled. Wow. That's great. Let's give him a hand. What do you say? Now, if they had only come and heard Pastor Steve talk to them about powerlifting and that kind of thing, do you think that they would be strong and they would meddled? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think he had them working out, building themselves up prior to that meet. Now, uh, I know a little bit about this, not, not with that kind of competition, but, if, if, you know, you could come and talk to me 30 minutes a week or something. We could meet and talk about running, and I think I could help you, but if you were going to run a marathon in a few months, you could meet with me every week, and we could talk about it. Wouldn't, I don't think you'd do very well. <laughs> Unless you built yourself up. Unless you did all the lonely miles. Getting ready. Week by week. A little more and a little more. And all that it takes to get ready. And uh, we could talk about it. And here's, here's my point. You can come to church and that's great. And you should. And we do learn the word of God as we come to church. But I want you to see that phrase again. Building yourselves up on, the most holy, on your most holy faith. It is your responsibility. Building yourselves up. We see it in Acts 20. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. See those words? Build you up. My job is to coach you. But if an athlete only comes to the chalk talk and never works out, he's going to lose. 
There must be individual commitment. I can't overstress the importance of this because this is probably in many of our lives the missing element. Well, I'm going to church, Pastor Carl. I know, and I'm glad you are, but I want you to know it takes working out during the week to be strong. Spiritually, you must be in God's Word. You must be building yourself up on your holy faith. Look at this verse in 2 Timothy 3. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Training. We must train to be strong. We must train to build ourselves up. And the Scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. If you want to be godly living, you've got to build yourself up. You've got to develop some strength. To remain, you've got to train. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And so how do I remain in the love of God? First of all, building up. Secondly, look at that verse 20. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. What's the next verb? Praying. You see it there? Praying. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Not only building on the faith, but praying. You learn a lot when you read God's Word and you discipline yourself day by day to read God's Word. And you've got your nose in it day by day and you are getting things out of God's Word. But to learn a lot is not enough. What you really learn is, I need God. I really need His presence. And prayer is man's greatest expression of faith. God will become so real to you as you get alone with Him. That's what our night of prayer is all about. Oh, I know we have it so that we can pray for Easter and that kind of thing. But I I want you to know it does more for us who participate than you can imagine. Coming in here and being, so to speak, alone for an hour. It's it. No Mitch leading singing, no Carl preaching, just alone in here where it's quiet. There's something special about it. And uh, there might be a half a dozen other people, but they are quietly alone with God. And you can sit in your chair, or you can get on your knees, and you can just talk to God. Jesus said to his disciples, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Giving God an hour is an amazing thing. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, what's that mean, Pastor Carl? It's like where the Bible says praying in Jesus' name. It means praying in His will. The Holy Spirit will direct your prayers. He will help you to know how to, know how to pray. To remain in the place of blessing. To remain in the love of God. In the, in the place where God can pour His love out, out on you. You must pray. Number three. There's a third one. Keep yourself in the love of God. Verse 21. What's the next verb? Waiting. Waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And that's our third verb. Building, praying, waiting, or looking. I put down looking. Because really that's what it means. It's looking for His return. Waiting anxiously. It doesn't mean with worry, but it means with anticipation. Anxiously. I'm so anxious. I'm so anticipating. I'm so excited. Waiting. All three of those words are in the present tense. Continuous, linear, not punctiliar. They continue. We continue to build. We continue to pray. We continue to wait. Continue to look. And then thirdly, not only remember and not only remain, there's a third R word here, and it is reach out. And we see this. In verses 22 and 23. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now remember, he's talking about apostates. And he's talking about how we should respond to them. Remember? So you're not caught off guard. Remember the words of the apostles? Remain. The love of God in the spirit of his love, reach out. 
This is evangelism. Reaching out to those who need Christ. Three groups to reach. First of all, verse 22, have mercy on some who are doubting. There it is, the doubters. The doubters. You were probably there one day, weren't you? You just had some doubts. When people have doubts, we're supposed to say, oh, that's awful. No. We're supposed to say that's okay. God can handle that. We all have some struggles now and then, and and you're doubting, and and, uh, do you know that Pastor Brooks at one time was a heavy drinker. His first marriage ended, ended in divorce. His second marriage to Barb was on thin ice. Barb didn't know what to do because of the condition he was in. And she just came to her wits end. And she, she had gone to church as a girl. Brother John had never gone to church in his life. And she thought, well, I'll go to church. She went down the street to Lafayette Bible Baptist Church. And somebody from that church invited Brother John to play on the softball team. He loved sports, you know. Brother John had hair clear down off his shoulders. Big old sideburns. He looked like a hell's angel. Some guys came by his house to talk to him about accepting Christ as his Savior. He sucked the dog on him. (laughs) He was a doubter, for sure. But you know what? That church accepted him as he was, loved him. And those guys who came by shared the gospel story, and John rejected it. But he told me that night, God awakened him in the night. He went in his living room, got on his knees, asked Jesus to save him. (laughs) He was working on a dock, (laughs) and they saw the change in him as time went along, and they invited him in the office one day, and they offered him a promotion, a desk job in an office, (laughs) and uh, Brother John said, I appreciate your offer for a promotion, but he said, I have to turn you down because God's calling me in the ministry, (laughs) and he went to his pastor and said, God's called me. His pastor said, we don't have anything in the budget for you to come on staff. He said, that's no problem. I, God called me. <laughs> and he served there in St. Louis for a while. And when the senior pastor left, we heard about him and we brought him here. Somebody reached out. Aren't you glad? What an impact he had. Reach out, God says, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Why should we have mercy? Because God had mercy on you and me. <laughs> and so we're, just, we're supposed to be compassionate. That's really what it means, compassionate, full of mercy, caring. And then not only doubters. And we see in verse 22. But verse 23, save others. This is not just doubters, but save others. Snatching them out of the fire. This is the deceived. These are people who have gotten involved in false teaching. These are people who have begun to follow the apostates. Snatch them out of the fire. (laughs) It reminds me of the story... Back in Genesis, when the angels came to Lot, and they said, you got to get out of Sodom. And Lot lingered, and the angels literally grabbed him by the hand and pulled him out of the city. Wow. It's the same thing, snatching them out of the fire. Get them out of that teaching. Do what you can. Uh, Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And then that's not all. Some who are doubters, and some others have mercy with fear. And then, 
On some, here's another group. On some, have mercy with fear. With fear, have mercy. Hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. These are the defiled. These are the people who've gotten so far into this thing, this bad teaching or whatever, that they have picked up a lifestyle that is a lifestyle that is to be hated. They're into immorality. They're into, it is their lifestyle. They're into perversion that is running rampant across our nation today. And uh, they're defiled. And God says, love them but hate the sin. Love them but do it with fear. Look out. Look out lest it touch you. Hate the garment polluted. Watch out. Hate the, hate the sin. You who love the Lord hate evil, the psalmist said. These are the nearest to hell. Do not become defiled by them, but reach out to them. Reach out to the doubters, the deceived, the defiled. And Peter tells us a little bit how to do it. First Peter 3. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness and reverence. There's how you share. There's how you reach out. And then again, 2 Corinthians. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then he tells us how we can be reconciled. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so we might become the righteousness of God. In Him. Remember, and every week we try to remind you, (laughs) remember, and every week, Sunday, Wednesday night, whatever, remain. We try to help you with that. That's why we have base classes coming up next Sunday. So you can learn not only to be fed here at church, but to feed yourself. And you go to 101 and 201 and you begin to learn how how to build yourself up. Remain. Remember, remain. Reach out. Reach out. Who could you reach out to in the next two weeks and bring with you on Easter Sunday? Can't come on Easter Sunday unless you bring a guest. Did you know that? We won't let you in. (laughs) Your neighbor, your coworker. Your brother, your sister, somebody in your family. As we celebrate the resurrected Lord. Remember, remain, reach out. There's one more R. You're looking on your outline, it's not there. (laughs) Because we're going to deal with it next week. It's in that doxology that we've been saying, 24 and 25. And it's rest in Him. Heavenly Father, we thank You that even though we live in a dangerous day of apostasy, You have given us some things and challenged us to be found faithful today. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I invite you where you sit in your heart to join me in this prayer. If you've yet to invite Christ to be your Savior, you can acknowledge, Lord, I am a sinner. I agree with your Bible. And I know there's a penalty on sin and Christ paid it for me. I repent of my sins and I trust him alone for my salvation. You can talk to him and you can pray. And invite Jesus to be your personal Savior. By faith today. 
And if you've already done that, God is calling you to remember, to remain in the place of blessing, and to reach out. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your call. Thank you for this strategically placed little letter of Jude that is so important to us in this day that we live today. Thank you for challenging us. Help us with this great challenge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.